I am very happy to be here uh, talking with uh, Mr. Steve Sawyer, the Secretary General for Global Wind Energy Council. Steve, thank you for talking to Panchabhuta. Can you please tell us a little bit about GWEC and your role in the organization? GWEC was founded in 2005 because the industry uh, felt the need to have a global representation, uh, international institutions like the uh, climate negotiations, the IPCC, the IEA, which had been being filled in a little bit by EWEA and AWEA and some of the other national organizations, but it wasn't really their remit. So uh, we were formed uh, in order to fill that gap and also to provide some sort of a networking function between the different uh, national and regional associations. I mean, for the first few years, uh, the focus was very much on the international climate negotiations because within the international community there was a, a strong feeling that uh, Copenhagen, the moment in 2009, was going to give us the opportunity to come up with a, a real new global climate deal um, and to put a price on carbon globally. Focus now is much more on the other energy-related institutions, and in particular now with uh, the new International Renewable Energy Agency. So that's one big part of our mandate. The other big part of it, of course, is to help uh, uh, new market development. Initially, we had a very strong focus on China, both in the time before GWEC was established um, and subsequently. Uh, subsequently a focus on Latin America, uh, particularly Brazil, but also Mexico and some of the smaller markets. And now in uh, what we call non-China India Asia, uh, and uh, as well as things starting to move in Sub-Saharan Africa. So we have our hands full. You have been extensively involved in a number of global initiatives, including the UNFCCC and REN21. How, the, how have these initiatives helped in the growth of wind? The energy sector uh, is something that is difficult uh, to deal with on an international basis. I would say, you know, we tried to get a uh, global agreement on energy at the original Rio Earth Summit in 1992. Uh, we tried to get an energy chapter in Agenda 21. That was blocked. We did the same thing at uh, Rio Plus Five. And we tried to get an energy-related Millennium Development Goal. Uh, that was blocked by the same suspects. Uh, we tried to get a global target for renewable energy at the Johannes Earth Summit, Johannesburg Earth Summit in uh, 2002. That was blocked as well. At which point I think the people who deal with energy on an international level, we really changed tack and realized that energy is such a fundamental issue that uh, at a basic level, national governments are not, governments are not going to give up uh, sovereignty when it comes to energy issues. Other than, I have to say, in the context of the European Union, where the, <clears throat> the regional targets have been fundamental to the growth of the renewable energy sector. So we've had to take a, a slightly different tack, I mean, particularly with um, uh, multi-stakeholder initiatives like REN21, uh, where we established the first uh, global status report on the status of the growth of the renewable energy industry, the first one in 2005. Um, of course, now with the establishment of the new International Renewable Energy Agency and working closely with organizations with uh, a, a specific energy mandate like the International Energy Agency and, of course, uh, the IPCC, which is of not directly uh, an energy-related institution, but uh, energy from uh, emissions from uh, fossil fuel energy uh, account for 60% of global greenhouse gas emissions so that figures very highly in the work of the IPCC. So I think what we've learned is that at least for now is that governments are not willing on a multilateral basis to discuss energy in its entirety so we need to approach it through a variety of different fora and a variety of different contexts and try to maintain some overall global focus. Now, IRENA is really a breakthrough when it comes to that, simply because it is the first multilateral agency which is focused on energy, albeit it's only renewable energy, it's not all forms of energy. But over time that may evolve and mature into a real global conversation about energy. Could you tell us a little bit about your experience as an expert advisor to the Chinese government on the formulation of the renewable energy law? Are there any takeaways from that for India that you would like to share with us? Yeah, the involvement in the, in the Chinese renewable energy law was fascinating for a number of reasons. Obviously, China, as uh, 
most populous country in the world and a bit of a mystery to most of the outside world for much of the post-revolutionary uh, period. Um, I found it extraordinary that the government of another country invited me and a number of other foreigners in to become directly involved in the advising them and, and formulating on the, uh, their renewable energy support law. Uh, no other country's ever done that, really. Um, and I think it says something about the Chinese. While they certainly uh, maintained control over the process, and, and it's not like we had any direct influence on the, on the formal formulation, in other words, a, a, a veto or anything like that, they, are, they were in that instance, and they are in so many others, very much like a sponge and that they really want to learn from what other people have done right and what other people have done wrong. And they're not shy about asking for that, and they're not shy about inviting people in to tell them what they think and all the rest of it. They'll take their own decision, but very, very open to that discussion. Whereas a lot of governments, including in my experience the Indian government, spend a lot more time focusing on how their situation is unique. And, you know, everybody, every big country will say, oh, well, maybe that might work in Denmark or in Spain or in the United States, but it certainly wouldn't work here. That's usually not true. Obviously, the circumstances are going to be different. But I think uh, every country, including India, would have a lot to learn from experiences in other parts of the world. Yes, it needs to be adapted to local conditions, but the basic physics and the machinery and the mechanics of energy production and consumption and management are have more to do with the laws of physics than the laws of politics. TREC has identified India and Brazil to lead the growth in wind installations for the next five years in a recent industry forecast. Could you elaborate on that please? Well, I think um, we identified uh, that in 2011, uh, in volume terms, uh, Brazil and India were the largest growth markets. Uh, and we Back in February, when we made those projections, we expected that to continue for a significant part of the next five years. Since that time, both economies have uh, caught colds, in a sense, and have slowed down a bit. So I'm not as confident about that projection as I was uh, three or four months ago. But I think uh, there's chronic power shortage in India, um, uh, and that is the single largest factor in any of the markets that we deal in as to whether the in wind industry is going to thrive or not, if people need the power. That's sort of a sine qua non, if you will. The same is true in Brazil. Uh, rapidly growing economy, an increase in demand, uh, capacity demand of three, four uh, gigawatts per year. I think that will continue. It might be a little bit slower than we thought a few months ago. But until and unless we discover another China, you know, a huge explosive market, that uh, the logical place is to lead demand growth and hence, uh, at least partially as a consequence of that, the leading uh, growth in the wind industry will be the two second most dynamic economies in the world, which are India and Brazil. This is the third edition of Wind Power India and GREC has been associated with all these editions so far. What is GREC's interest? Well, we're interested in India, obviously, as the world's second and soon to be first most populous country, one of the most dynamic uh, economies in the world, and a significant uh, source of both experience in the wind industry, but also in terms of market growth. So and IWTMA, our Indian partner, was one of the founding members of GWEC, and we've been working closely with them uh, since the beginning of GWEC, certainly, and uh, we have a large vested interest in seeing the Indian market uh, continue to grow and evolve and thrive and mature and uh, become one of the and maintain and, and grow as one of the, the mainstays of the industry globally so it makes perfect sense for us to put a large priority on helping uh, in whatever way we can to facilitate the market development and growth in India. A number of global manufacturers have established large manufacturing facilities in India. What do you see as the biggest reason for this? With any market that is of a significant size and associated with a, a, a large and a growing economy, uh, it makes perfect sense to locate manufacturing facilities in the country, both from the point of view of trying to uh, increase your presence in a, in a major market, but also in terms of the economics of the industry, which for the most part means that if you have a large market, it makes sense to co-locate uh, manufacturing uh, in, in the same territory 
for economic and, and logistical reasons. I mean, we're fundamentally different than the solar PV industry is that, that you don't just roll them out of the factory and pop them into a shipping crate and put them on a boat to the other side of the world, transporting, especially with the more modern large turbines, it's, it's very expensive and logistically complicated to transport them over long distances. So uh, putting manufacturing uh, as close to the point of sale and use as possible just makes economic and practical and logistical sense. What are the most critical elements and requirements for the large scale that is being planned in the wind energy sector over the next five years in India? I think the most critical factor in the ability of the Indian wind market to maximize its potential is uh, an increasing level of joined up thinking and joined up transmission on a, on a national level. Um, and infrastructure really, not just transmission, but uh, in, infrastructure. Uh, transmission and distribution, uh, supply chain manufacturing, etc. The Indian market, like the United States, like Canada, uh, like a number of other territories, is driven primarily by the state or provincial or regional level, uh, both in terms of policies and in terms of the uh, support schemes that are available to the sector. Um, and while I don't anticipate that that's going to go away in India, I think the federal government can and must play a larger role in terms of infrastructure planning and development in terms of, of uh, strengthening and making more coherent the uh, financing that is available to the sector as well as uh, making an effective production-based uh, support scheme to replace the accelerated depreciation which has been the main uh, federal driver of investment in the sector to date in India. Um, that is changing now with the tax code and the phasing out of accelerated depreciation, but the generation-based incentive is not yet sufficient to, to change that. There's the new rec market, uh, which seems to be going quite well, at least in the early stages, and there's the expressed intent of the Indian government to move away from private investors, primarily driving the sector to one where independent power producers are much more welcomed. I think all of those are healthy. I think the programs to support them need to be a bit more coherent, and I think there needs to be a way to have a conversation to increase the, both the coherence and the interconnection between the federal program and uh, the individual state programs, and that can only really come uh, from the federal from the federal level in India. I know that's a difficult one because, of course, the states have uh, uh, played the major role to date in the power sector, but I think if India is going to move uh, in the direction where most politicians seem to want to see it go, then it's going to require a good deal more coordination on the federal level, much like the situation here in Europe. I mean, for Europe to realize its renewable energy ambitions requires multinational thinking, uh, which would be the equivalent of you know, getting the different states in India to work together. It's not easy, but it has to be done. As the Indian wind energy market leads the growth, what kind of platform does Wind Power India 2012 provide to international stakeholders? Well, I mean, certainly, uh, you know, we're in a, in a situation now where the global industry has grown and matured. We're becoming increasingly competitive uh, with conventional generation, even on the very uneven playing field that exists now in an increasing number of markets. India is no exception to that, and as the single largest growth market in 2011, and probably again in 2012, um, we think it's a, a prime opportunity for those who aren't familiar with the market uh, to learn about it, and for those who are, to uh, increase their stake and increase their market share, and uh, not only uh, come to exchange views about policy and uh, technology, but also to uh, do business and strengthen their market position. And we think that Wind Power India is the perfect platform for that.